couldn't do it today, but then it was a safe time. Uh, most people had never seen anyone like us. We were kind of dressed in the style of Soho in 1955, you know, with a fisherman, white fisherman sweaters and black fingernails and rope sandals. And, and our basic life, you know, it was trad, uh, jazz. It was, um, it was just to live in the moment, really. So uh, when we got to Paris, it, you know, one of the, the big things was, uh, though I didn't realize it at the time, was uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Simon de Beauvoir, who asked us to go every, every morning at 11 o'clock. And um, they would teach us what we were, because they were very excited, because here were two girls, seemingly without any resources. The resource we had, we could dance. We were both, we loved dancing. We danced for the love of it, any place, in the street in Sidney Bechet's club, just anyway, we just danced and that's, that's what we did and we traveled and we lived in the moment, you know. So he said, you are existentialist, you know. So I thought, well, at long last, I've got an identity, so that's good. Um, and he, they said a lot more to us and I, I wouldn't remember even if I'd have understood it. I mean, I didn't understand French too good then, I don't really know totally what they said. But it was a kind of stamp on, I guess, on my life, this idea that I could uh, live in the moment, not have any kind of recourse to the future and not kind of worry about the past, that I could go forward. Um, and it was rubber stamped by these sort of adult people who were also kind of grown up bohemian, well, bohemian people. So when we got to Spain, we were going to go on to Seville and um, and see the gypsies, you know, who lived in the five villages around Seville. When we went into Girona, I fell in love with the city and I fell in love with the man, Jose Teres, immediately. He was the first person I met. So the, the great uh, travel to become gypsies to the soul ended. She went home, Beryl went home. And I stayed and I became his novia or fiancé. Now I think when, you know, I made that kind of arrival in his life, I think that had something to do with chosen. It was like I, w I represented something to him which was of the town but not in it. I wasn't Catalan. I didn't have any of those values. Um, I seemed to be able to survive. Um, and. It was, I was the kind of person that when things about Ren Le Chateau came up, in my relationship with him, and indeed they did from time to time, the word, you know, Ren Le Chateau would kind of come across and um, I would understand it always meant trouble. So, if uh, Tares and a few other people went, say, to a nearby sea resort and uh, they talked to a po poet who was a Kabbalist called Salvador Esfriel that we have to do something about Ren Le Chateau. This is going back into the 50s because of someone called Noel Corbu has bought the hotel, which used to be the, actually used to be the Villa Bessania, where the, the priest lived with his maid, the maid looked after him. That's Baron J. Sonia and his maid. Um, turned it into a hotel and wanted to make it work by saying this is where the buried treasure of the priest is. So all these people came with shovels and they were you know, looking for, for gold. Um, so those in Girona had to do something about this place over in the Pyrenees, just over the Pyrenees. Um, so there were these kind of, um, kind of intervals behind closed doors or the door sort of open. I could see something going on then the door would be shut. So I never really understood it. I didn't. Um, I thought it was to do with politics because he was a Catalan national um, who took out the, those who Franco was most, um, most hateful against. Perez would rescue them, take them over the Pyrenees. They'd be in France, they'd be safe. So he was a sort of hero. He was somebody people listened to. That was number one. What he really was, I didn't know then. I didn't know till a lot later. To fast forward to um, the mid-1990s, and I was 